I want to talk about some of the specific, uh, I guess, aspects of, of your job that uh, some of these advanced tools and technologies are helping you do more efficiently. Um, and I, and I sort of cr created a list and I'm not sure, you know, I, I created a list with question marks because I, I you, you know, it's sort of like, well, you tell me, but I would assume maybe you tell me if I'm wrong, uh, things like <laughs> I, I'm going to, I'm going to work through the bullets. And if you can maybe give me a yes, no, and a little bit of color on, on how or why, uh, you know, we're seeing efficiency gains in these areas, that would be great. So like one would be developing analytical methods and, and, and if so, which. Yeah. Um, you know, we have like a standard set of assays that we're looking for for programs. Um, and so, you know, luckily we have a fair amount are established already. Um, but when we have new programs that come in, you know, we, for, for the DNA that we're working with, we do, you know, a fair amount of in silico modeling up front um, before diving in into the assay development. Um, and that, you know, that's specific to, to things like the tighter method. Um, so that, you know, is, is helpful and we are able to identify issues up front. Um, sometimes there are, you know, issues with, with the design and then we can go back and, and tweak things. Um, and that, you know, is able to make, make that process go, go more efficient overall. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the other stuff is, is high, higher throughput screening. Um, so, you know, making sure that when we're doing the assay development, that, that it is in a format that can support higher throughput. And that, that's helpful both for the method development um, to understand, you know, better understand robustness as well as, as ultimately for when you need to start testing samples. Yeah, yeah. What, what about assay determinations, like de determining uh, what assays to run from the outset? Yeah, um, that that's a f interesting topic because, you know, we think about things kind of from two perspectives. One is how do you make decisions during process development phase, where where you know you may be running a large um, a large experiment and you're really interested in in the relative results across the different conditions versus, you know, a, a release assay that's going to end up in a QC lab where the assay needs to be, you know, very robust and repeatable and ideally simple to, to use. And so those are two very, you know, very different problems. And so we look at it kind of from both, both angles because if you can get data that allows you to make development decisions quickly, even if it's has imperfections that that can be helpful for developing a process rapidly um, but when you're talking about qc you know it really really needs to be a robust reliable you know accurate precise method to to go into a qc lab and so you know we have have some technologies that that we're exploring um you know in pd in the pd space but that we may not or wouldn't be be suitable to move forward to to, to manufacturing or QC. Is that a result of those technologies not being, uh, I don't know, I'm just taking a flyer, is it mature enough? Or, or like, do, do you, do you if you look into your crystal ball, do you see a, a day where, where those technologies um, improved could be applied in, 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 in manufacturing QC applications? Um, yeah, they, they could be. I'd say that, um, you know, one of, we were talking earlier a little bit about percent fold capsids mm -hmm. and, and this is a really important attribute and the gold standard tends to be analytical ultra centrifugation. This requires a fair amount of material, um, is timely, has, you know, a, a heavy amount of data analysis. And I think that'll, that'll remain, you know, the standard going forward, that'll be the expectations from health agencies. Um, you know, there are, yeah, there are sponsors out there using, using TEM, but I think AUC is, tends to be the, the standard. So I don't think that would change, but it's not suitable for, from process monitoring and it doesn't get you rapid results. And so, you know, you can look, look at other methods that may give you results in, in development 
and yeah, maybe you could consider moving it to manufacturing as an orthogonal method. Um, but I, you know, I don't think it'll, it'll replace, you know, what, what is the QC standard necessarily? Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Um, getting back to my, my list that you're going to, you know, you're, you're going to tell me whether the legitimate, uh, <laughs> legitimate advantages or not, um, executing stability and comparability assessments. Um, yeah, here I think stability is, is fairly straightforward and similar, you know, across modalities, you know, understanding what, what your stability indicating assays are and then running, running your, you know, your real time and accelerated conditions to, to see the profile of the product. Um, you know, for comparability is maybe, maybe a place where, where some of the newer technologies um, add value uh, so talked, you know, a little bit before about improvements in in the long read sequencing, and so I think that, it, from my perspective, is an important aspect of of some extended characterization that that can be done uh, when when you're going through comparability exercise. Yeah, yeah. Um, establishment and monitoring of process parameters. What what, what how, how is tech contributing to that effort? Yeah, there, I mean, this goes back to looking at the data sets that you're generating. So, you know, ideally you have have small scale models of, of your ad scale processes. When you're early, you know, those models may not be fully qualified, but, you know, you start to develop enough, enough knowledge around the process to understand, you know, where you may have limitations of the model. And so there, you know, you're starting up front during the development to to come up with the process control strategy, understand what what the critical process parameters are. And so you're starting from, you know, those large experiments with high throughput upstream and high throughput downstream systems that form the basis of your process design. And then as you move it, move it into larger production, um, monitoring and seeing, you know, identifying, do you have any gaps in knowledge that are coming, you know, potentially from scale up or differences between between equipment, um, and then, you know, go back and, and study those. So like one is you mentioned this empty and full ratio downstream. Uh, what are you using specifically to, uh, to measure that? Yeah, as I mentioned, the gold standard is analytical ultra centrifugation. Yep. So, um, you know, we do we do rely on that. Um, yeah, we do look at at other technologies that could give us in insight into the empty full ratio. So, you know, you can look look at UV. You can look at SEC malls. So there's, you know, other technologies that you can use to monitor the process, and and we explore those as well. But the gold standard, you know, for for the actual product itself is is AUC. Yeah. Okay. All right, capsid titer and, and genome titer. Yeah, so historically, you know, I think most are using um, ELISA kits for the capsid titer. So this, you know, tends tends to be a standard. Um, commercial kits aren't always available, in which case, you know, sponsors may need to develop a, a custom antibody to be able to do do an ELISA. And then on on genome titer, you know, it, it varies, but it tends to be some form of PCR. So some use qPCR, some use digital PCR, some use DDPCR. Um, but again, here there's you know tools that are coming out that may not be used in in QC necessarily, um, but that can give you quicker quicker reads. Um, so BLI technologies like like Octet or Gator can be used to, to look at the capsid titer. And then, you know, for the genome titer, it's looking at uh, workflows that are, that are faster or simpler to operate and get, get readouts quicker. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about aggregate content? Yeah, here, um, you know, you can be looking at, at SEC methods, DLS, um, things, yeah, things like that. Um, so those are, are fairly, fairly standard for monitoring aggregation of the product. Yeah, okay. Uh, capsid integrity? 
Yeah. So um, here, you know, you could have have just running traditional gels, um, as well as as CE type type methods. So those are things that that we'll deploy. You know, depending on on the product in question. Yeah. All right. Um, do, do the rest of the, I mean, you, the, the bullet points, do the rest of the bullet points I have on there make sense or are there more important, uh, I guess, topics that you'd, you'd hit on there? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think um, gene therapies are, are highly complex products. And so we, we need to look into to the capsid structure um, as well as, as the, the package inside of it. And so, you know, I think the the tighter methods cover a good amount, and there's um, some interesting improvements that are that are taking place there around multiplexing. So being able to better you know better understand when you're tightering what's in the product, and then coupled with with the long read sequencing that I talked about earlier, you gain you know a greater understanding of of the product itself. So those those are pretty important from my perspective, so that you you understand, um, you know, you, you do start to understand your product better and and understand the process levers that that lead to high quality production. 